Welcome to Madang. Today's wonderful guest is Chris Hedges on his new book, Our Class. He shares about his ordination, prison ministry, white liberals in the church, Jesus and the insurrection, and prison versus slaveholders manual, and so much more. Please stay tuned. Please join over 3,000 people on Homebrewed Christianity's online class, Christianity in Process. This is an online pop-up learning community with Dr. John Cobb and Dr. Trip Fuller. Make sure you read their books too. You can win a chance to get Cobb's complete works, which is valued at 1250 Please follow Homebrewed Christianity as Dr. Fuller has other amazing weekly podcasts. Join him as he celebrates 14 amazing years of podcasting and has become the most listened to theological podcast in the world. Rooted in the Christian Quaker tradition of contemplation that inspires action, ESR prepares theologically diverse students for a pluralistic world. ESR offers many graduate programs such as Master of Divinity, Master of Arts in Peace and Social Transformation, Master of Arts in Religion, Master of Arts in Theopoetics and Writing. ESR also offers postgraduate certificates such as Bivocational Ministry Certificate, Entrepreneurial Ministry Certificate, and Writing as Ministry Certificate. Furthermore, ESR offers scholarship funds that do not have to be paid back, such as the Cooper Scholar Program and Sterrett Scholar Program. Please check ESR website at www.esr.erlum.edu for all degrees, certificates, and scholarships. Anna Luisa crafts high-quality jewelry pieces at very affordable prices. They're carbon neutral from packaging to products. I really love this about Anna Luisa. Their designs are unique and will make you feel empowered, elegant, and at your finest. They have fair prices with jewelry starting at $39 and new jewelry collections are released every Friday. Go to shop.analuisa.com forward slash madang for Anna Luisa's buy one, get one 40% off sale. Free shipping and returns in the U.S., I know you'll love them. For sponsorship inquiries, please email madangpodcast.gmail.com. This is Madang, an outdoor living room for guests to share their experiences and their work. I invite you to come in and stay for a while. Welcome to Madang. Today's very special guest is my friend, Chris Hedges, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, who was a foreign co correspondent and bureau chief in the Middle East and Balkans for 15 years for the New York Times. He is a cultural critic and author who was a foreign correspondent for nearly two decades for the New York Times, the Dallas Morning News, the Christian Science Monitor and the National Public Radio. He holds a Master of Divinity from Harvard Divinity School and is the author of bestsellers, American Fascist, Empire of Illusion, and was a National Book Critics Circle finalist for his book, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning. He also writes a weekly column for Sheer Post and has a weekly show on the real news. And you can find him at chrishedges.substack.com. So Chris, thank you so much for sure. coming on Madang to discuss your latest book, Our Class. And I have a wonderful signed copy of it. So thank you so much. I know you're so busy writing and speaking and you got all these uh, shows that you're producing. So thank you so much for coming. Sure. So your book, uh, it was praised by Alice Walker, a powerful moving <coughs> book that could make graspable why today's prisons are contemporary slave plantations giving voice to the poorest among us and laying bare the cruelty of a penal system that too often defines their lives. And that's uh, a praise from Alice Walker. And Cornell West says, this magnificent book gives a human face and a voice to those our society too often demonizes and abandons. It exposes the terrible crucible and injustice of America's penal system 
and the struggle by those trapped with it, within its embrace to live lives of dignity, meaning, and purpose. So I just love your book and I learned so much from your book. So thank you so much for coming on today. I'm just wondering, you know, at the beginning you say, <clears throat> Teaching in state prisons returned me to my original calling as a minister, working with those who lived in depressed urban enclaves. So you say that right at the beginning of the book. So how did you get into this um, teaching in state prisons? And I know you take theologians with you and I've asked you many times to take me. I've never been with you, hopefully one of these days. So just so share us how you got into this and what it means for you. So when I was at Harvard Divinity School, I lived in Roxbury uh, across the street from the Mission Main Mission Extension housing project, which was the most violent uh, project in the city of Boston. Commuted in for my classes, came home, ran a small church and a youth group, uh, and was going to be an inner city minister. I was very in influenced by William Stringfellow um, and uh, my great mentor at, uh, Colgate, where I did my undergraduate degree, had uh, spent um, 15 years as an inner city minister, first in East Harlem and then later in Chicago. Um, but I ruptured with the liberal church, which liked the poor but didn't like the smell of the poor. Uh, students at Harvard who talked about empowering people they never met. By nature, I was a writer. Uh, I had already published when I was in college in the Christian Science Monitor. I took a leave of absence. I went and studied Spanish at the language school in Cochabamba, Bolivia, run by the Mary Noel Missionary Society, freelanced for a year, ended up covering the Falcon War out of Buenos Aires for National Public Radio, wrote for the Washington Post, went back and finished my degree uh, under heavy pressure from my parents, both of whom had seminary degrees. My mother was a professor, my father was a Presbyterian minister. Uh, and, but then turned right around and went to El Salvador to cover the war. So I always put myself for 20 years into distressed situations in Latin America, later seven years in the Middle East. I covered the war in the former Yugoslavia, out of Sarajevo, later Kosovo. Uh, and when I came back to the United States after two decades of this kind of work, uh, I have a neighbor here in Princeton. Uh, Celia Chazelle, who at the time was the head of the history department of the College of New Jersey. There was no college program. This was back in 2010. And uh, she was teaching semester long courses for students in the prison system who had finished their GED. Uh, there was it was non credit, you didn't get academic credit. But if they did the coursework, she would print up a, a certificate at home and put it into their folder, which would help with before the parole board. And she was having a hard time getting uh, professors to go into the prison. I taught as a visiting professor at Princeton, Columbia, NYU, um, University of Toronto. And, uh, and so I started. That's, uh, so it was really her impetus. Uh, but I think it was a kind of natural gravitation towards uh, a segment of our society, just as I did as a foreign correspondent, a, a population that uh, was oppressed and, uh, and not given a voice uh and uh, have been i've been in the prison system then ever since and then Rutgers started a very fine college degree program through it's nj step uh where students can earn their ba degree in prison and 2013 i began teaching in that program with Rutgers. i've also taught that taught an inside out class uh at princeton uh where half of the students are uh Princeton students and the other half are students who are incarcerated. Wow, you have this whole history of travels and covering wars. Weren't you ever afraid when you were at the different wars like the Balkans and Yugoslavia? I don't know how you even survived sure. all that. Sure, I mean, you know, being in combat is frightening. Wow. <clears throat> when I was in Sarajevo and was being hit with 300 shells a day, four to five dead a day, uh, two dozen wounded a day. When I, by the time I got there in 1995, 45 foreign correspondents had already been killed. So my oh. photographer was wounded three days after I got there. Yeah, I like a you know I spent a lot of time in combat, uh, and uh, like a soldier, suffer from the trauma of that. Wow, that's amazing that you survived it all, and then you went to finish your MDiv. A lot of people don't know about you 
about you having that uh, MDiv degree and that you you finally got ordained, right? I did. Uh, I, I had actually gone before that because in the Presbyterian Church, as you yeah. know, uh -huh. you are approved for ordination before you go to school. And uh, then I, I had to go meet with a committee. At that point, I had bought a one way ticket because I was, didn't have any money uh, uh -huh. to El Salvador to cover the war as a freelance uh -huh. reporter. My father, who'd been a Presbyterian parish minister for three decades, was seated outside the room. I met with the committee. They asked me what my call was. Uh -huh. And I told them I was going to go to El Salvador and cover the war. It was kind of a long silence. Uh, uh -huh. And the head of the committee said, well, we don't ordain journalists. And that was it. Uh, and I told my father, and it must have been uh -huh. difficult for him, not only because I had come so close to ordination, uh, but because I was about to leave for a very dangerous conflict uh -huh. where journalists and photographers had been killed and would be killed. Uh, but I remember my dad saying, well, you were ordained to write. Uh, and when I came back to the United States for over a long time, I was running a, also on weekends, I was running a support group for uh, formerly incarcerated men and women in the city of uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey, out of uh, the Second Presbyterian Church, which was run by my former, actually went to Colgate and Harvard, a former classmate of mine, Michael Grandson. It was Michael who uh, generated the whole process. It's online. You can watch the ordination online. Cornell West spoke. Uh, we threw out the Presbyterian hymnals and brought in a blues band. Uh, and James Cone uh, did the uh, ordination. It was the only ordination James Cone ever did. Wow. What year was it? I don't know how I didn't come to your ordination. 2014, I think. Oh, wow. That's and yeah, it was I don't all, know why I wasn't there. It was all geared towards mass incarceration. So we invited uh -huh. the families of my students. Uh -huh. We spoke about mass incarceration. My wife, who had taught for a summer teaching poetry in the supermax prison, read poems by her students, uh, but it was all geared. And I rewrote a lot of the uh, uh, kind of call and response uh, readings myself, uh, mm -hmm. because I find the stuff that comes out of uh, the uh, common book of prayer, whatever, the, yeah. you know, kind of dead, very dead. <laughs> So it was yeah. things like, you know, where were you when they crucified Matthew Shepard? We were not here. You know, oh. where were you when they crucified the people of Vietnam? We were not here. Um, so, yeah, it was wow. it was real and and, uh -huh. and it was moving. Um, and and the church was really filled with people I cared about. Wow, that's that sounds like an amazing thing, because we're both PCUSA. And I think that's where we first met at some ethics meeting somewhere in New York. And um, it's just, I always get so excited when I meet another fellow PCUSA because we are like a dying breed. <laughs> so it's well, so that's great. Right. We're yeah. dying off pretty quick and it's our I own know. fault. So we got, <laughs> <laughs> we got to uh, build each other up and it's so exciting. So I'm so glad that you wrote this book because in one way it felt like you were being this prophetic voice, like preaching in a sense and sharing some of these deep personal pain of those who have been incarcerated. And so it's such an important book for the wider society, but I think those who are in the church, because we neglect um, to, to talk about uh, mass incarceration. And I teach an ethics course, and maybe I cover like 30 minutes of it. We don't do enough. But in your book, you actually wrote, mass incarceration is a civil rights issue of our time. So can you expand on that? Because that kind of uh, stopped me. I thought, wow, I never thought of it that way, but it is like your whole book kind of points towards that and the, the, the importance of us kind of tackling this issue. So can you share with us? Well, sure. Uh, it's, the primary, it's the primary, along with militarized police, it's the primary form of social control for poor people of color. So you de-industrialize the places where they live. You, in, in Emil Durkheim's terms, you sever the social bonds that knit them to the society, work, a sense of place, community, all of that is gone. Uh, and then those social bonds, which Durkheim argues correctly, integrates you into a society. Uh, and, and, and because of that integration form, a kind of de facto uh, type of social control, because you are invested in the system, when those are gone and you're forced into the illegal economy, uh, then coercion, a naked, very naked coercion, becomes uh, the only way that the dominant ruling class are able to exert control over the population. Um, and that's why we have the largest prison system in the world, 
of the world's prison population. And let me just throw out that 40% of the people in our prison uh, system have never been accused of physically harming another person. I mean, we, we are this insane country that can lock people up for life for drug uh, offenses uh, and or these RICO laws. So I will get students, uh, I'll just pull an example, one student uh, who's I write about in the book, Boris Franklin, uh, he's a single father, by the way, and a foreman at a warehouse, I mean, a, and pulls in a decent income. Uh, he's in a room with 11 other people, there's a drug deal, it goes bad, and he doesn't know any of the people who are involved. Uh, one of them shoots and kills another one. Now, if you don't immediately call 911, everybody in the, which you can't do in the hood because you're marked, you know, if you're going to, as a snitch. So uh, everyone in the room is charged. Everyone in the room goes to prison. He didn't have a gun. He didn't pull a gun. He didn't, this is just insane. Now, this is common. And I would say easily 20 or 30% of the people that I taught and teach never committed the crime uh, for which they've been convicted because, again, there are no jury trials. 94% of the people in our prison system are coerced, is the right word, to plea out. And how does that work? Well, the police and the prosecutors stack all sorts of charges against you, which they know you didn't commit, and then they use them as bargaining chips. So actually, the students that I teach with the longest prison sentences are the ones who didn't commit the crime because they actually go to trial. And so that all of those charges are arrayed against them. And that's, uh, that's, that's typical. Uh, so, the, the, as, and as Michelle Alexander has pointed out, if, if uh, uh, everyone had a jury trial, the system would crash. It's not designed to give jury trials. It's just absolutely horrendous. It's designed to lock up uh, poor people of color and remove them from the communities, uh, especially the men, although I have taught in the women's prison as well. By, by the way, the women have it far worse than the men because the men usually have some kind of support system, either their girlfriends or their mothers or their wives or whatever, uh, but the women just get a, tend to get abandoned, uh, first of all. And second of all, they lose their children. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, to foster homes. Uh, it's, it's just absolutely appalling. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's it, we say it's a dysfunctional system, but it's not really dysfunctional. It functions the way it's designed to function, uh, which is to take uh, an abandoned, segment of the population, what Marx would call surplus labor, and throw them into bondage, which is why prisons are run like plantations. It's under the 13th Amendment, you don't have to pay minimum wage. There are prisons in Georgia where people work 40 hours a week and aren't paid at all. In New Jersey, they can make $28 a month for a 40-hour week. Meanwhile, the commissary prices, everything's been privatized, have, have more than doubled. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, and then the fines, if you're sentenced, you're given all sorts of fines. At one student, he didn't commit the crime. He was for, this is the other thing is we throw people in the prison system as juveniles and, and sentence them as if they're adults. So this is a 14 year old kid. Both his parents had died. He's living in an abandoned building in Camden, New Jersey, without heat or electricity or running water. Uh, there's a rape and a killing. He didn't commit it. Uh, and the police grab him uh, because, of course, if you find somebody, grab them and charge them, you don't have to investigate it. Uh, they, uh, he has no parental uh, protection. He has no legal protection. They hold him uh, three big detectives. He weighs 90 pounds at the time uh, and force him to sign a confession. He's illiterate uh, for the crime. He goes to court. He hears what he has been charged with. He said, tries to protest that he didn't do it. <clears throat> he's sentenced as an adult. Remember, he's 14. Uh, and he's not eligible to go before a parole board until he's 70 years old. Um, this is just insane. And, and, the, and the number of lives that are just destroyed, and not just their lives, but the lives of their families and the impact on their communities. Because once a family member goes to prison, in a way, you're all in prison. Uh, it's, uh, and, and, and what the system does is fleece you for money. Because if you want to communicate, for instance, through the phone system, you've got to pay in advance. Uh, Global Telling, if you want to transfer money through JPay, they take this, I think it's 15 or 20 percent cut. Uh, if, uh, uh, medical is privatized, so they'll charge you. A commissary is privatized. Everything's privatized. We talk about private prisons. So that's not the problem. The problem is that within federal and state prisons, all of the services are privatized. And then, as I mentioned, you're hit with fines. In the case of Lawrence, this kid from Camden, 
he was hit with ten thousand dollar fines well he has no support no money so he is earning his 28 dollars a month and every month they're taking out two dollars he leaves prison we got him out because under uh the miller uh, supreme court ruling on miller uh it, they uh decided that you could not uh a sentence uh, juveniles as if they were adults he served 30 years we did get him out um but he gets out with thousands of dollars of fines. Now, if you can't pay those fines, and it's very hard to find work uh, with a long prison sentence, uh, they'll throw you right back into prison. It's just an absolutely insidious system. Uh, and it is the civil rights issue of our age because it primarily affects poor people of color. Yeah. Like the the amount of information about mass incarceration in your book was so astounding to me. So as you mentioned, you know we have twenty five percent of the world uh, the prison population, but we're only America's only five percent of the world population. So that itself is astounding. And that, and you just mentioned about Boris, and I know uh, when your book came out, you and Boris were interviewed together. I think for Powell's book. Yeah, so it's so interesting to hear from him as he is also in the book. And you end with him, you know, he was the first student released um, in 2015. He had to buy the clothes for $50 to leave prison. And they only make $28 a month working a 40 hour week in prison. So that to me is so heartbreaking that it is this, uh, you know, mass incarceration and a multi billion dollar. Um, industry and you repeat that and you and for me I just like what are we to do as Christians because it is so astounding and you know scripture is clear about you know be with the poor and and visit those who are in prison so what are we supposed to do because most times we we just turn a blind eye and even the book you said, because uh, you bring in Cone so much you said ancient Greeks like Cone understood that we gain conscience only by building relationships with those who suffer. But as Christians today, we want to turn and say, there's nothing wrong with the prison industry. You know, they, you know, we don't know all the stats. We think everyone there is guilty. Um, they are all violent, you know, they're out to kill everybody. So we have all these false um, stories and stats and narratives. So particularly Christians, but then also wide, like, what are we to do? Because you also say, you know, most many of your students were, um, I think, Muslim students right. um, coming from different. And so you're not there to bring them Jesus. So what 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 are we to do, especially those of Christian faith and then beyond? Well, I, I was once invited to a synod meeting. Uh, I avoid all of that stuff like the plague. Um, but there was a, uh, a uh, workshop on mass incarceration where a bunch of white Presbyterians were sitting around deciding what they were going to do for people locked up. Uh, and I got very angry. I said, well, it's not really your decision. It's their decision. Why don't you ask them uh, what you should do? And they're very clear that uh, what they want is a campaign for the minimum wage because that will break the back of the system. It just becomes unaffordable. Uh, if they have to pay people minimum wage for the work they do in prison. I mean, I have students who get out after 30 years, they have again worked 40 hour weeks and they have no social security. Uh, and, and we have to listen to them. That's the first thing. Uh, of course, it's kind of why I don't like liberals uh, because they listen exclusively to themselves. Uh, and it, it's, uh, it's primarily about self adulation. Uh, uh, the, the, when I said, you know, we should organize uh to pay minimum wage it was just, everybody in the room just went silent uh and they said well because of course that that is taking on the system and it's taking on the system on behalf of those people who are incarcerated and their families because if they get the minimum wage and they're in prison they may be able to send money uh for their children mm -hmm. uh they might be able to pay for uh, all of the privatized services including you know if a family immediate family member dies or is on is dying, uh, you can visit them for 15 minutes, but you have to pay the overtime of the guards, which is hundreds of dollars, often over a thousand dollars. So a lot of people don't visit. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, you know, we do have to confront the system and we have to listen to those people who are on the inside about uh, what it is they need and what it is they want. Um, but the Presbyterian Church showed zero interest in that. It, um, and uh, 
The second thing is, you know, the Christian church has, uh, uh, I think, since the divorcing itself from the 60s, my father was very involved in the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, the gay rights movement. Actually, my uncle was gay. This made him highly unpopular in the Presbyterian church. Uh, and uh, he was very close to the Berrigans and all of that was swept aside. Uh, and that notion that uh, the battle for justice, the battle against oppression, the battle for the voiceless uh, is what real spirituality is about. Martin Luther King, I think, uh, writes about this quite eloquently in the end of, I think it's Strength to Love, and uh, after they throw a bomb into his house. So uh, that's where it is. Uh, but we, like the wider culture, retreated into this how is it with me spirituality, which is just narcissism. Uh, and, uh, um, and so, yes, we, we have to reclaim our credibility. And that means walking into these spaces and not 80% of my students are Muslim. Uh, and, but they all are aware, although I don't wear it on my sleeve, that I am a Presbyterian minister. They know it. Uh, and uh, my one of my favorite moments, uh, you know, Lawrence, who I mentioned, the 14 year old has no family, so uh, they won't release you, even if, if uh, they, uh, which they did, the judge agreed that he could get out on time served, the, the state won't release you unless you have an address. Well, he had no address because he has no family. Uh, so I had to raise $20,000 and rent him an apartment in, uh, for a year, uh, and months before he got out, so he had an address. And then my garage was filled with uh, vacuum cleaners and beds and cl even clothes, uh, uh, all donated by formerly incarcerated people, by the way, or dropped it off. Uh, and I remember, and I was the person in the court who uh, was called up uh, on his behalf. Uh, and it was they don't, uh, you know, once you get into that system, even when you teach in the system, if you, uh, even those of us who are teachers, are often uh, not well treated by the corrections officers. They don't like the programs. They don't like us. And uh, uh, so I went in the morning when the court session started at 10 a.m. Uh, they don't tell you who comes out when. Um, so it's four o'clock in the afternoon. I've been there all day, and I wore a clerical collar. It's, it's about about three or four times in my life I've put one on. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, I'm the only one left. So the sheriff's deputy opens the door and sees that I'm obviously there for him. And he goes, who's that effing minister? Uh, and Lawrence goes, that's my pastor. And Lawrence is Muslim. And that for me is what, uh, you know, what it means to uh, enter a prison a as a form of Christian witness. That's my pastor. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, because even in your book, you, you did uh, write, the point of ministry is to bear witness, not to dream up schemes to grow congregations or engage in religious chauvinism. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is what we do. Well, you know? the disease of the church is, uh, you yeah. know, hiring for some enormous, ridiculous sum of money, people yeah. who can help churches fix their websites <laughs> or, uh, you know, this is just nuts. Uh, it, no. it, it, and it just shows how insular and yeah. how out of touch the church has become, which is why it's dying as an institution. I mean, these are just social clubs for retired people, uh, especially in the inner city where the, the old, that old white congregation, they may talk about wanting to reach out to the community. In fact, they don't want anybody from the community to walk through that door, uh, especially if they've been in prison. Uh, so, uh, you know, the church, like many liberal institutions, is uh, in deep distress. And I think it's in deep distress because its values are wrong and its tactics are wrong. I mean, the amount of money in a presbytery that you spend on overhead for administration and then look at the amount of money that they spend to carry out mission work in distressed communities. Uh, it, it's just parasitic. Uh, and, and the people who run these presbyteries and uh, synods are uh, careerists. Uh, they uh, seek uh, primarily to perpetuate uh, themselves uh, at the expense of everyone else. Uh, and uh, and they, they, you know, the, the whole goal is not to be controversial because you're bleeding membership. They're either like falling over dead or walking out the door, nobody's joining. And so you end up becoming increasingly more insipid. Uh, I was, I don't know why, somebody invited me in a wealthy New Jersey church to give the peace and justice sermon. Uh, you would think they would have 
taken five minutes to look at what I write and what I say, uh, I was seven years in the Middle East and I talked about how, which is true, that our drones and missiles, uh, airstrikes, uh, artillery had decapitated far more people, including children, than ISIS has ever decapitated. Well, that's when they started walking out. <clears throat> and it was interesting that uh, it's good because nobody ever invited me to give another sermon. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to give them, so that's fine. Uh, and uh, uh, I was actually teaching W. E. B. Du Bois's book, The Souls of Black Folks, uh, and my class. We were struggling with what, uh, which Du Bois later repudiated, but the, this idea of the talented tenth that you had to train the upper tenth of the black bourgeoisie, like Du Bois, who was probably America's greatest intellectual, you could argue. Um, <clears throat> so my students are saying, well, we're not the talented tenth. And I said, well, let me tell you why Du Bois is wrong. Uh, and I related what had happened that Sunday. And I said, no, everybody in that church, they were almost all white uh, and upper middle class. They all had at least college degrees and probably graduate degrees. Uh, and within the wider society, they are considered the talented 10th, but they couldn't hear a truth. And it wasn't just an opinion. Having spent you know, months of my life in Iraq, I, I uncovered the first Gulf War. I was taken prisoner in Basra uh, during the Shiite uprising. I mean, I know it. Uh, and uh, they couldn't hear it, but you can hear it. Uh, because of course, privilege is a form of blindness as uh, Shakespeare reminded us in King Lear. Uh, and uh, especially white privilege, it's a form of blindness. And as a white American male living most of my life around people of color, poor people of color, Palestinians and Salvadorans, etc., I had to come to grips with that. And I did, and I speak fluent Spanish and I speak Arabic, um, but realizing no, no matter how hard I tried to integrate into that culture, because I'm white, because I'm male, because I'm American, that blindness will always exist. It will finally never be totally overcome. And therefore, I, if I recognize that blindness and I listen uh, to the voices of uh, those who are oppressed, I can build, as I do in the prison, real relationships, but always cognizant of that blindness. Wow, thank you for sharing that. So, and then, you, you know, going on with the Christian theme, you also write that Jesus was crucified on a cross as an insurrectionist because he bore the witness to the divine truth that no one has to be defined by his or her circumstances. So I find that fascinating um, that you use the term insurrectionist. You know, we, we are dealing with that with the January 6th event here in the US. Do you want to say more about Jesus? And I know you bring out a lot of James Cone, um, the cross and the lynching tree. So share us a little bit more about that. Well, sure. I mean, but certainly the Roman authorities certainly saw mm -hmm. Jesus as a political figure, whether Jesus did or not. Uh, but because because he defied Roman law, Roman yeah. law didn't. Uh, and in fact, it was the whole upending of Roman law. It was the primacy of conscience, uh, which was an anathema in the ancient world. That was why Socrates was killed, of course. So uh, yeah, he was he was certainly killed as an insurrectionist, uh, and uh, uh, he. We also have to remember that Jesus wasn't white. Um, the Romans were white. <laughs> Uh, Jesus was a person of color. I remember being in a refugee camp in, uh, I believe it was Honduras or Guatemala, but it was a, it, no, it was Guatemala for uh, refugees from the war in El Salvador, and it was the Day of the Innocents, and they were decorating the whole camp. And I know that passage by memory. I heard my father read it every Christmas. So they're decorating the whole camp, and they were going to have a big fiesta that night. And I said this, is probably an illiterate campesino. I said, well, why is uh, this is such an important religious holiday. And he looked at me and said, well, because that's the day Jesus became a refugee. Now mm -hmm. I had knew that story almost verbatim, but I didn't understand what that story meant if you were forced to flee because of violence from your home. And that's a perfect example of how uh, people who live in distressed circumstances under oppression, read the Bible and see and hear things, those of us in privilege, don't don't hear I didn't hear and really see the import of that biblical story until that moment. And I graduated from Harvard Divinity School. 
Thank you so much for sharing that and for emphasizing, you know, we need everybody at the table and but for so long in the church, you know, they didn't want to hear from women or from people of color. And it's like that and still in so many cases, you know, on social media, people will say crazy things to me as a woman and a woman of color. So there's a lot of things that we need to still uh, fight back and, and, and hit back on. So I'm always appreciative of you, Chris. And I know when you used to write those weekly columns for Truth Dig, you, you just read at the point and you don't mince any words. So I'm always appreciative of you and for you always kind of um, encouraging uh, people of color and women to speak up and to share our perspective and our voices. And I'm, you know, we have always said that Jesus was not white, but I'm always so thankful when a white man says it to, to remind us because your voice is heard a thousand times louder and clearer than if I said it. So I, I thank you so much for reminding us again. So in the book, in our class, you also put on this, or you write this play called Caged. So can you just share us a little bit? It's, it's very moving. And then, you know, you share at the end that, you know, your audience was only supposed to be Cornell West and James Cone, and then all they decide to move it to the chapel and you got the guards there too. So kind of share us. Um, right, so I was. was teaching drama, August Wilson, uh, Mary Baraka, James Baldwin. And it was clear in the first class that uh, they didn't really have much experience with theater. Not surprisingly, since if they wanted to see August Wilson cost $150 on Broadway. So um, uh, that just gets in the whole refusal to fund the arts uh, in the United States. Uh, you know, again, uh, a sort of making the arts a kind of appendage of the wealthy and the white, um, <clears throat> who of course cater to the, whatever they want. So, uh, uh, I, and I, I also didn't know at the time that one of my students uh, knew who I was because he'd heard me on WBAI, that, which they can pick up in the prison. This is the Pacifica station out of New York. So he'd actually gone and recruited the best writers in the prison, some of them very, very impressive writers. And uh, so I said as a throwaway, well, OK, I'm going to have you write dramatic dialogue. So you begin to understand how drama works, because everything is conveyed through primarily dialogue. I mean, uh, the actors add a lot to it, but dialogue is key, unlike a novel. So uh, the first uh, batch had 28 students of scenes come in and a, maybe five or six of them are just brilliant. And this happens after a few weeks. And then I decide that I'm going to help them write a play that there's not that I know anything about playwriting. Uh, um, and I was working on a book and I just had to drop it. Um, and I because I was the general editor now for this play and uh, um, uh, added another day every week. I can add students if they need remedial help. So I just signed all 28 of, of them up for remedial help. It was a little grumbling, but they all showed up. And we ended up writing this play and, and it really ended up being transformational because they were writing about their lives and things they had been in prison for years or decades and never told people within their own cell. It got very emotional and very powerful. Uh, I mean, to the point where some on some days they couldn't even read what they'd written. Uh, and the stories that came out. And so as we put this play together, um, it, there, I, I think there's nothing in there that didn't happen to one of my students, including one of my students who's locked up in Trenton at, in the first night, the guard comes over and tells him that's the cell his father was in. Um, it, it's just, uh, so um, we, we wrote this play. At the beginning, I said, who wants a part? Seven students wanted a part. And then as it got on, all 20, I had to write 20, we had to write 28 parts, which is ridiculous. It kind of looked like a Fabian tract by the end, but everybody wanted their voice. Uh, and uh, I knew I couldn't read it because it's quite incendiary about prison conditions. So I invited James and Cornell, which isn't easy. It takes about six to eight weeks to get uh, security clearance to come in. Uh, and they came in as our audience. And then, as you mentioned, I got to the lobby and the warden, the administrator was there. And uh, they got in a wind of what was going on. And he said, you're not going to read this in the classroom. You're going to the chapel. And he, the warden, the administrator was there along with this kind of phalanx of white uh, corrections officers. And my students huddled because uh, they knew, I, obviously, the retribution would be taken out on them, perhaps on me, but certainly on them. Uh, and uh, so they decided what 
sections of the play they could read and what they couldn't. Uh, it was really powerful uh, because it was their experience, their life, their voice, uh, and it became very therapeutic. Uh, the the uh, the bonds that were created in that classroom continued long after that class and even outside of uh, prison itself. And if you go on the real news, uh, in fact, just the last couple weeks, uh, or go into YouTube and type in The Long Road Home, mm -hmm. uh, it's a two-part series that I actually worked quite a bit on where we uh, interview five of the students, two of whom, Boris and Kabir, were in that class. Uh, and uh, I think actually Thomas Dollard was also in that class. So, uh, but it's about the struggles that formerly incarcerated people face when they're released, uh, because in many ways they're still in prison uh, mm -hmm. in terms of denied all sorts of jobs, all sorts of restrictions. Uh, so uh, yeah, and those, those relationships continue to this day. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. And your book is so rich. There's like all these things about prison codes and and snitches. And, I, you know, you need like a few days to go through the whole thing. And I know you're so busy. So if you can say, I know you mentioned it at the beginning of the interview, but you also write in the book, uh, the manual is written for slaveholders in the antebellum South on the management of slaves differs little from manuals and tactics used by prison administrators. To me, when I read that, that was very shocking to me. So can you kind of um, share with yeah, us? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's breaking. It's mind blowing breaking. to me. So the, the, this was uh, the great book, The Peculiar Institution by Ken Stamp, uh, which did the groundbreaking work on slavery in the 50s. And he wrote it by obtaining these manuals where they show you because you're, you have a white, uh, owner and a, maybe a white family, but you're surrounded, you know, if it's a big plantation by a few hundred enslaved individuals, how do you control them? Well, you control them by creating divisions, creating hierarchies. Uh, it's what Malcolm X would call the house N and the field N and this kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, punishment and that the same way in the prison. So the goal is to, I mean, for instance, I taught a class, a history class, a few years ago called Conquest. We read Open Veins of Latin America, uh, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, and CLR James's great account of the Haitian uh, independence uh, movement, the only successful slave revolt in human history, uh, Black Jacobins. And uh, I had given uh, my class a syllabus, and they knew that I was a certain week I was speaking to the University of Montana, and I got a phone call from the prison. And they said, this is the Special Investigations Division of the Department of Corrections of the state of New Jersey. Are you aware that your students just let a sit down strike in the prison? Uh, and I had not been informed, but they'd obviously read the text. Uh, and, uh, and of course, what the prison did is strip search the cells and, to find the leaders. And they found the two leaders and they sent them off to another prison, shipped them to another prison and put them in indefinite solitary confinement, which is where the leaders of the Free Alabama movement, which did a strike inside the prison demanding minimum wage, also indefinite solitary confinement. So uh, it's, it's, it's exactly the same. I mean, there's uh, including corporal punishment, uh, isolation, uh, beatings. It's, uh, it differs very little. It's just another iteration of slavery, uh, just by another name. Wow. That is, it's, heartbreaking for me to see that and that it is actually real. Thank you so much, Chris, for um, writing the book, Our Class, first, and also for spending um, some time with me to discuss it. It's such an important topic, I think, not just in our churches, but in the wider community, in seminaries, you know, in ethics class and different historical classes. I think it's such an important book. So thank you so much. And for those who want to view your show it's a weekly show on the real news and you can follow chris hedges on chrishedges.substack.com so, so the, thank the you show, so the show and the column are both sent out through substack it's a, oh it's okay a, the column is, is sent out through substack but it's printed every monday on sheer post uh, okay out of, out of la Okay, great. And you are on social media in different places like Twitter and Facebook. So I don't, they I don't run it. There. I'm not yeah, on, someone I'm else not on any social you. media. Other people run those accounts. Yeah. I don't, I, I you're can't big enough. You're, too, Facebook. you're so big that you need other people to run it for you. No, I don't need, like, I don't want, I don't do it. <laughs> I'm very hard to find on purpose. Yeah. Well, thank, yeah. thank you so much. All right, Grace. Yeah, thank you. 
And thank you so much. So um, now that this pandemic is kind of ending, I hope to see you in person someplace. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you thank so you. much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Please join over 3,000 people on Homebrewed Christianity's online class, Christianity in Process. This is an online pop-up learning community with Dr. John Cobb and Dr. Trip Fuller. Make sure you read their books, too. You can win a chance to get Cobb's complete works, which is valued at 1250 Please follow Homebrewed Christianity as Dr. Fuller has other amazing weekly podcasts. Join him as he celebrates 14 amazing years of podcasting and has become the most listened to theological podcast in the world. Rooted in the Christian Quaker tradition of contemplation that inspires action, ESR prepares theologically diverse students for a pluralistic world. ESR offers many graduate programs such as Master of Divinity, Master of Arts in Peace and Social Transformation, Master of Arts in Religion, Master of Arts in Theopoetics and Writing. ESR also offers postgraduate certificates such as Bivocational Ministry Certificate, Entrepreneurial Ministry Certificate, and Writing as Ministry Certificate. Furthermore, ESR offers scholarship funds that do not have to be paid back, such as the Cooper Scholar Program and Starrett Scholar Program. Please check ESR website at www.esr.erlum.edu for all degrees, certificates, and scholarships. Anna Luisa crafts high-quality jewelry pieces at very affordable prices. They're carbon neutral from packaging to products. I really love this about Anna Luisa. Their designs are unique and will make you feel empowered, elegant, and at your finest. They have fair prices with jewelry starting at $39 and new jewelry collections are released every Friday. Go to shop.analuisa.com forward slash madang for Anna Luisa's buy one, get one 40% off sale. Free shipping and returns in the U.S. I know you'll love them. Show your support and please order Invisible, available wherever books are sold. For sponsorship inquiries, please email madangpodcast.gmail.com.